presidency of the nation's first black president, Barack Hussein Obama, officially ends today at noon. When a man with a very different vision for America, Donald Trump, is sworn in as a 45th president of the United States. When I interviewed President Barack Obama one year into his first term in January of 2010, he laid out his vision for governing as a nation's first black president. The, the basic principle is, A, that we are aspiring to universal opportunity, that if we do the right thing on health care, we do the right thing on education, that's going to help African Americans and Latinos more only because they're further behind, but it's not because we're targeting them on the basis of race. There will be some circumstances in which, for example, closing the achievement gap, we should pay special attention to the fact that, you know, we can't afford to have African American children, you know, graduating from high school with eight grade reading levels because that's our future workforce and that's going to be bad for everybody. And I think the African American community uh, like every community, should say we've got some particular problems that need redress. And the Congressional Black Caucus appropriately should be focused on some of the majority uh, in their communities that are really hurting. Uh, the only th difference I would have would be if it is framed in terms of just helping one racial group or one ethnic group as opposed to helping everybody. Some groups may need some particular help because they're so far behind. But the more we frame this as Americans who are coming together to get things done and to encourage each other's success, the better off we're going to be. I've been the first one to say that my election didn't represent a, the end of racial controversies or the solution to race relations in this country. We've been dealing with this for hundreds of years. We've got a legacy of slavery, of Jim Crow, of discrimination. There are still suspicions and stereotypes that linger in our culture. Those things aren't going to go away overnight. I don't think anybody expects them to. Uh, I think that what we can honestly say is that progress has been made. I'm in the Oval Office. You are able to do an interview for a black-owned TV station. <laughs> Those are things that didn't exist, not just 50 years ago didn't exist 15 years ago. Uh, and so the, obviously things have changed, but that doesn't mean that there's not still going to be uh, the need for constant uh, evolution on the part of the country so that there's greater understanding, greater empathy. People are not subject to some of the sensitivities that they are right now because everybody feels like they've got an equal stake in our society. We're not there yet. I think we're going to get there. I think it's nice that African American kids around the country can say to themselves, you know, maybe I can aspire to be president too. I think that's worth something. I think it indicates the progress we've made and uh, the openness that uh, American society has to judging people on the merits. But the bottom line is I still have to perform as president. And, you know, if uh, after having gone through the worst financial crisis and recession since the Great Depression. Uh, we are not rebuilding this economy in a way that's more fair, more just, provides greater op uh, employment opportunities. Uh, if I have not succeeded in that, then I think people uh, are right to be frustrated and right to be angry. The only thing I ask, not just from African Americans, but from all Americans, is to understand where we start from. We started in a deep hole. You know, it always amuses me when I hear Republicans talking about, look at all this debt and deficit that he's accumulated. Well, time out. The overwhelming portion of the debt that was accumulated was accumulated when we were not in recession, but in economic growth mode for eight years. Bill Clinton left a surplus that got ran into trillions of dollars of debt and a $1.3 trillion deficit that I inherited. So hold me responsible for what am I now doing to solve that problem. But don't act like, you know, I just landed here, <laughs> you know, uh, with, with a blank slate. The same is true when it comes to employment. When I, when I was sworn in, in January 20th, it turned out that we had just lost 650,000 jobs in December of 08, lost another 700,000 in January of 09 before I had even uh, figured out where the bathrooms were in the West Wing.
and had lost another 650,000 in March before our plans even had started to be implemented. So the bulk of the 7 million jobs that we lost this year occurred before our plans had any opportunity uh, to get going. As long as people understand that, the baseline from which we were starting, then I feel very comfortable being judged by what we produce. All right, folks, I'm going to begin our conversation this way. So in 2009, I interviewed Reverend Al Sharpton uh, for Ebony Magazine's Power Issue, and we talked about how do you assess uh, the legacy of President Obama? What should we as African Americans uh, uh, look to? And so this is what he said in 2009. How do you measure it? You measure it by the index level in society. Where are we in health care? compared to the general population? Where are we in education? Where are we in our medium income level? Where are we in terms of our ability to develop our families? Same way you measure everybody in society, the goal was to have equal access, equal opportunity, and equal protection under the law. As long as we go to jail three times more for the same crime, the same criminal background, as long as we're number one in the nine worst diseases in the country, as long as our schools don't function, we're not there yet. Very simple. So with all the drama, whether we're going to march, whether we're going to go to the cocktail party and, and lobby, whatever we're going to do, at the end of the day, if that data hasn't changed, we have not made progress. If the data has changed, then we've made progress. That's how you measure it. Because let me, let me tell you a little secret to the Ebony readers. We got a four to eight year lease in the White House. We didn't get the deed. The day will come when Obama's not there anymore. And the generations behind us will measure us by those index levels. I remember in 1989, we elected a black man in New York, right? Gorgeous mosaic. We thought that the world had changed upside down. Four years later, they put him out of City Hall. The index level of blacks in the city hadn't changed. I've seen this movie before. You got to use the openings to change the level of life. Otherwise, you will have a moment of joy that will be immediately followed by despair if you don't understand. It's an opening. It's like a football game. You see an opening, you run the score. If you just celebrate the opening, you're going to get tackled. Roman. Dr. Jason Johnson. <laughs> he is absolutely correct. And by that definition, uh, I would grade Obama maybe a C plus. There are some areas that improved. Uh, there are some areas where he could have made a, a much better legacy that he did it. <clears throat> you look at issues like civil rights, civil liberties, he didn't really do all that much. He pretty much advanced the kinds of things Bush did. We, we had domestic spying, we had that sorts of issues. You look at uh, domestic policing issues. There were some surface things that were done, not enough convictions, not enough changes. He left a lot of points on the field by not putting in a lot of judges, certainly in these last couple of days when he could, when Congress is on recess. Uh, were there some health care improvements? Sure. You look at financially, no. I mean, with, with 40 something percent of African American wealth lost during the Great Recession, primarily through housing, there was not nearly enough effort 53%. put in. 50, 53 percent, exactly. There was not nearly enough targeted effort put in to help black people regain their footing that was lost during the Great Recession. So I give them a CC plus. Angela. So <clears throat> I think. Um... I think this is this is really interesting. I first want to kind of flag some of the challenges that he was up against. One, of course, is unprecedented Republican obstruction. That said, that does not mean that he did all that he could and left nothing out. That's a sermon that my pastor <laughs> once preached. Um, when I think about the clemency initiative that was run out of the Department of Justice, um, the fact that he's conservatively used pardons, but he has overwhelmingly used commutations mm -hmm. to ensure that there is some type of parity within CJ reform, but also the fact that a Republican Congress wouldn't take up a criminal justice reform bill. When I think about him pushing an American Jobs Act that could never even get consideration on the House floor, and now we're talking about what types of deals Democrats could broker with the Donald Trump when they just wholeheartedly ignored this. Um, when I think about the fact that the Congressional Black Caucus went on a jobs initiatives tour to deal with black unemployment that was sky high and one of the most tense moments we had with this president. Um, and then I look at where unemployment is and, now. And the Black Caucus got attacked for that Absolutely. because they got, they got ripped to shreds by saying, how dare y'all speak right. against the president. That's right. I know I was the executive yeah. director at the time. But I, I think that 
it, it just demonstrates how much of a balancing act this was, mm -hmm. how much of a tightrope black folks had to walk. We had to be careful utilizing our platforms and criticizing mm -hmm. the president. Um, and, and it's frustrating because I also think of things he said like, if you want something done, make me do it. Um, he talked about a rising tide lifts all boats. Well, we ain't got no damn boat. Mm -hmm. So there are all of these other challenges that exist, and so it's not uh, a 30 second uh, uh, answer I could give right. you. It's probably a book. <laughs> Brett? Well, I would say, I mean, along these same lines, I think Barack Obama uh, miscalculated. I think there was a heavy overinvestment in the politics of personality. Mm -hmm. uh, the Democratic Party looks like it's in shambles. And now he wants to lead the next iteration of building a force. No, bruh, you had your chance. And, and it, I didn't know TV One had a time machine rolling for you to actually have that interview with Al Sharpton <laughs> eight years ago. But he doesn't even have that much bass in his voice anymore. That's a different Al Sharpton that we've seen over the last eight years. But, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to a very important point. What was the relationship of Barack Obama to organized black political movements and leadership? The CBC distancing we hear. Bringing in people and saying anyone who's critical of the, the president, including some viewers probably watching this now, uh, you can't be critical of President Obama. No, it's our obligation. And for him to borrow that language from Franklin Roosevelt and previous generation, make me do it. And then to go on lecture tours when he did, did, did deal with black people, his annual, let me talk to black people speech, therefore, and chastise us over and over again. This man miscalculated so I don't know I don't know doc I might I might give him a C I might give him a D plus Lauren uh, you know, it's hard to give him a grade on this. Angela makes a really good point. We can never forget when we talk about this president, he dealt with historic obstruction like we have not, never seen in right. American history. There's no doubt about that. When we look at the hard data, though, when we look at the unemployment rate uh, for African Americans, as Angela brought up, you know, it hit 16.7 in, in late 2011. The CBC goes on a job tour. The White House gets pissed off about it. Well, that 16.7 was a 28-year high, highest since Ronald Reagan. Now, he did get it back down to 8.1, which is where it is now, which is very commendable. But if you look at Bush's lowest number, it's 7.6 in 2007. Clinton's lowest numbers were, were in the sevens. And, you know, at his first press conference, he was asked about this. Are you going to do targeted help to, for African Americans? He didn't do it. I don't expect the president to do everything, but I do expect Hilda Solis or somebody to come out and say something. We look at the high school graduation. She, she, she was that, labor secretary. She was labor and secretary fact, and said absolutely and, nothing no, about no, black unemployment. No, but, doing, <laughs> no, no, but the reality is, that, not true. Uh, the problem is they didn't put her out other places. She appeared on this show more than anywhere else. Well, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just saying, I mean, because during Washington Watch. The but White go House ahead. wanted to act like black unemployment, the issue didn't exist. When it comes to specific help for African Americans, they get real quiet. I gotta okay? go, uh, hold tight one second. I gotta go to a break. What I want folks to understand is that uh, th this, folks, is not meant to be uh, a big celebration. It really is to look at the data, uh, as Reverend Sharpton talked about, uh, and also Mark Morial, the National Urban League. And speaking of that, uh, when we come back, we'll hear from Mark Morial as they give their grades to the president on the issues Angela mentioned of criminal justice reform uh, and those issues. So we'll talk about that in our next segment uh, on our special, the first President Barack Obama's uh, presidency uh, right here on News One Now on TV One. We'll be back in just a moment. Kickstart your day at 7 and get the news you need from the perspective you want. News One Now with Roland Martin every weekday morning at 7 on TV One.